welcome. Looking forward for this final keynote of the day. Remember, uh, audience, that you can send your questions to Richard through the Q&A. Don't miss this opportunity and watch out for that Enigma sentence that we'll reveal during Richard's keynote. So, Richard, whenever you're ready, all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're very uh, happy to be here and to share with you some experiences on good AI for good. Why good AI for good? Well, because usually, and I think you've seen that also in this conference and in many other events, we speak about AI for business. It's all about how can we use this technology to improve our business, to generate more revenues, and to have better operations. Yeah? But actually, what I want to state here today is that this is actually much bigger. Yeah? There are more things that are important. It's not only business. Actually, there are four things that matter. It's AI for business, it's AI for good, but you have to use a good AI and also more recently a green AI. Yeah? So what does it mean? Yeah? Let's very briefly look at what this means. So first of all, we all know the AI for business is a huge business opportunity. Yeah? Almost $16 trillion by 2030, according to an estimation of price uh, PwC. Yeah? Many use cases, many different sectors. And also in Spain, yeah, there is now an, a consortium of AI of, of the industrial sector. Uh, the government has an AI strategy where they will invest 600 million euros in the coming three years to develop this technology for business. Uh, huge opportunity, but I will not talk about that today. You've heard that a lot and that is known. Uh, then there is the, the, the AI for good, yeah? the non-commercial opportunities. We all know the challenges we have with the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We have to reach them by 2030. Uh, less than 10 years to go. There is the climate change uh, challenge. You can use this technology very strongly to improve uh, those objectives, to help them achieve, to monitor them. them yeah? Also very important if you think about artificial intelligence. And then you have the other part, the good AI. Yeah? So AI has huge opportunities as we've seen, but it also has uh, often unintended negative consequences, ethical risks for our society and for the people. Yeah? If you look at the slide, <coughs> you all remember, yeah? Facial recognition that recognizes better, AI recognizes better uh, white men than, let's say, black women. Is that fair? Do we want that? Yeah? We have systems that help hiring people for companies and they favor men over women. Something we don't want. It's not that those things happen uh <coughs> on purpose, but it still happens, yes? You should uh, avoid those things, yeah? Something like the, the, the Asimov laws, yeah? you have to have laws that help you avoid those things. So you want to avoid those negative uh, things of AI. That's good AI. Yeah? And then more recently, we have also the green AI, because there are some studies that show that big models, yeah, like uh, the big tech uses to uh, understand, to do machine translation or to understand natural language, train one training session of such a model may take uh, may have an equal carbon footprint as five cars dur during their whole lifetime. Yeah, or another la na natural language model that uh, has generates the same footprint as three households for a, one for a whole year. Yeah? And if you look at the energy consumption of those algorithms, then there are some studies that said uh, GPT-3, a big model, natural language model of OpenAI, spent about uh, one training set 12 uh, 12 million US dollars in energy. Yeah? So it's not that you can just run the big models as, as, as often as you like. You have to be very careful about that. It's not only models, also uh, think about all the photos we have our on our phones yeah? and all the emails we have in our inbox. They're all somewhere in the cloud and they all have a footprint. So we have to become more aware. Yeah? So this is the four parts that are, in my view, for the future, become very important for AI. And if you want to do AI, as an organization at the large scale, you have to think of all four of them and not only on the business part. Yeah? But today I wanted to talk for you only on two parts. Good AI for good. Yeah? And I start with the good AI, which has to do with the ethical use of AI. Yeah? And first is about ethical principles yeah? of artificial intelligence. Now we've already seen those of the ch some of the challenges uh, with this technology. Yeah? I mentioned facial recognition, but there's another problem that is about explainability. Yeah? If those algorithms help take decisions that impact people's life, like access to a public university 
or uh, a medical diagnosis, then of course you have to know how those decisions are taken on what they are based. Yeah? And many of those models, the, s the biggest models uh, and the pow most powerful models, they're actually black boxes. So it's very hard to understand how it happens. And that's something you have to work on. And think about the gender bias in all the professions and how that permeates in uh, machine translation. Yeah? If you translate, uh <coughs> if you simply translate um, nurse in, in Google, to Spanish, you get the usually the female forum, yeah. And if you translate engineer, you get the the male forum. So it's not that Google wants uh, Google translation wants actually to to discriminate, but it still does it, yeah. And that's because how this technology works. So we have to work on avoiding those risks to happen, yeah. Think about privacy. Uh, think about the future of work. Those are all consequences of using this technology at large scale that we have to think about in advance. Yeah? So what are organizations doing against this yeah, to avoid those negative consequences? Whereas they are unintended. Yeah? I'm not talking here about doing harm on purpose. It's about unintended negative consequence. First, there is an example of the European Commission that came up with guidelines for trustworthy AI that have like seven requirements. If you want to deploy an AI system that has a high risk for people, then it should comply with, it should be transparent, it should not discriminate, it should be safe, it should, be, it should have privacy. So there are seven requirements that <coughs> you have to fulfill with if you want to use that technology. Um, Telefonica as a company about three years ago, actually this month or last month, issued their ethical principles, which is the use of artificial intelligence in all of the business should be fair, it should not discriminate, it should be transparent and explainable when needed, it should be human-centric, so put the human in the center, and it should be with privacy and security. And if we work with third parties, with providers, then also they should, to some extent, comply with those principles. Yeah? And as Telefonica, as the European Commission, there are now currently hundreds of organizations in the world that have issued and publicly declared if we would use AI, we want to do it, or we want to avoid to, uh, to cause those kinds of problems. Yeah? There's even a study, several studies, this is one of Harvard University, where they took the, fir the first 36 organizations in the world that issued their principles and they analyzed them of how important are they and how do they work. <coughs> and then, so now you're a specific company and you have to define your ethical principles. So what do you do? First of all, yeah, you can be overwhelmed by the amount of uh, principles that are available because in the end, the potential ethical impacts of this technology are huge. Yeah? You have on the one hand things like transparency, explainability, as we just saw. You have the future of work. You have even super intelligence, yeah? super intelligent computers. You have the concentration of data and power. And then you have also privacy, security, uh, human agency. So a lot of things. So if you are a company or an organization, you want to work with this technology, you want to choose some principles to make clear that you're not going to make any problem. So which of them do you choose? Now, now there are very various, way, uh, various dimensions that you can use to actually come up with uh, your principles. The first is that you think about what is within my scope, what I can act on. Yeah? So what is related to my organization versus what is more responsibility of government. So if you talk about the future of work, or the uh, liability of artificial intelligence systems, that's more government oriented. But if you speak about robustness, safeness, privacy, it's within your realm. So make a division between uh, those principles that you can act on, yeah? and that's the pool that you should start with. Then you also sh could think about, well, the things that I do and I know that I do, of course, that's not a risk for me. So you have to distinguish between intended uh, uh, purpose and unintended consequences, yeah, and actually focus on the unintended consequences. A few years ago, all of the th the, the challenges that I mentioned before were actually unintended consequences because nobody knew that they were happening. Yeah, so uh, Google Translation doesn't generate, uh, doesn't uh, create gender bias because it wants. It's an unintended consequence. Yeah, but over time we've learned a lot, so much that at a certain point in time, if an algorithm discriminates, you can say, hey it's not unintended anymore because it's known, so they should have been able to avoid it. That's another important distinction that you have to take into account if you want to select your principles. Yeah? So this is the, the pool where you can look from on the left-hand side. The things that 
who are within the scope of the organization and the things that are unintended. Yeah? And then two more dimensions that you can look at if you want to choose. First of all, an end-to-end -end versus an AI-specific approach. Now, if you speak about privacy, uh, human values, security, that doesn't only apply to AI. It applies to any digital system that is out there and that, that, wor that works. And they have to fulfill with those principles, of course. And if you look at the AI, the very AI-specific parts, there are things like fairness, non-discrimination, bias, human agency or control, autonomy, how much autonomy do you give to the system, and transparency and explainability. Those are very specific for AI. So if you already have the other things arranged in your company or organization, focus on the AI-specific ones. If you really want to make a statement, our end-to-end -end approach of AI is, uh, is ethical, then maybe you want to t include all of them. Yeah? And the last dimension you have to take into account is the one in which sector are you in? Yeah? Of course, it's not the same being in industrial sector or in the medical sector, in the public administration. Yeah? Different criteria or different principles may have a different importance. So it's also you should think about. Especially as if you are in the services industry, then usually uh, you think a lot about fairness, uh, transparency, explainability, because you work with people. If you are in the industry, you have a factory with a lot of machines and you want to do uh, predictive maintenance, then actually it's less a uh, matter of people, it's more about safety and robustness yeah? and security. So those are four dimensions that you can think of uh, for coming up with the principles for your organization. Now, once you have the principles, of course, it's nice to have a statement, we will not do this or we will not do that, but then how do you actuate it into your organization? Yes, so that is implementing your uh, ethical principles. And then, so we came up with a methodology like privacy by design, security by design, we call it responsible AI by design. Yeah? And that has five ingredients. First of all, the principles. Second, a lot of training and awareness of what this means, yeah? like I'm doing right now. Um, a questionnaire, if you develop a system or want to buy a system, questions that you think about for each of those principles to make sure that you're taking the right decision. A lot of tools, of course, because this is all related to data. And you have to understand the data, yeah? and you can't do it just by hand or with an Excel. You need technical tools. And finally, a governance model. Yeah? So the roles and the responsibilities of each of the different actors in an organization. Yeah? As an example, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, a course that uh, an online course that, that we made in Telefonica where every employee can understand what this means. We have also a questionnaire online that for every product that is launched into the market that uses AI, you have to go through the questionnaire, have to have answers to some questions. And if not, you can ask it to some, some experts. Yeah? There are several technical choices that you have to make uh, that have an impact on, uh, on the social impact of this technology. Yeah? That's about if you have a system that continuously learns without human intervention once it's in the, in the market, uh, you have to think about how much autonomy do I give to the system versus how much I keep as a people. Is human in the loop, human on the loop, or human out of the loop? Bias and discrimination you have to think about. How explainable does your system need to be? Yeah? What happens to the errors? Is a false positive equally important as a false negative? For example, in COVID test, a false negative is much more important to avoid than a false positive. Yeah? It's further, uh, further uh, propagation of the virus versus confining one specific person. Yeah? Um, so there are many technical things that have an influence of on the, the on the on the imp on the on the society of your AI system, and that's what you have to think about and take explicit decisions, not just doing things, but record those decisions. Yeah? And you need this government's model uh, where you have to think about what happens if I don't know something about a certain question of the questionnaire uh, for for the ethics of AI. Uh, how do I solve it? How do I escalate it? So you have to put it in place so it's clear that if something is uh, difficult happens, you know how to deal with that. Yeah? So <coughs> uh, that is how you can implement those principles. Now, if you do this on a voluntary basis, yeah, like many companies have done, then probably you'll be well prepared for the upcoming uh, European AI regulation yeah, that is coming out in a few years uh, that distinguishes between forbidden uses of AI, so the unacceptable risk, high risk AI, uh, where you impact really in people's lives if you make a mistakes. It's about hiring people with those systems, about promoting people with those systems, but it's also about access to uh, essential services like health, uh, education, 
uh, and those kinds of things. So there are eight identified areas. Then there's limited risk AI. Think about chatbots where there's an obligation that uh, the provider of the chatbot tells the people who interact with it that they're actually speaking to a machine and not to a person. But also if you want to do a deep fake, yeah, this uh, fake videos about famous people that you can make them say what you want, you have the obligation to identify uh, uh, this is a fake video. Yeah? Uh, if you don't do that, you are um, in compliant with, with the law. Yeah? The large part of systems, of course, will be not high risk, not limited risk, so you can just use it. And if you want, you can use a voluntary scheme as we have uh, seen. Now, that was good AI. Yeah? How can you build an artificial intelligence system that doesn't have negative consequences? Of course, it's impossible to remove every negative consequence, but if you follow what I've said, using a methodology, thinking about well about the principles, then the likelihood that you enter up in the press with some kind of scandal is much lower. Yeah? And it's all about that. Now we go to the second part. Use this technology for good. Yeah? Not for business in this case, but how can you use it for good? Now, think about um, how you can use data. Yeah? What does data mean? Yeah? It's something like uh, in, pl in, in Plato's uh, cave, uh, where you actually see a reflection of reality. Now, if you see the, the video on the right hand, you see all kinds of bubbles f uh, lightening up uh, on a map. Actually, this is mobile activity just before, during, and after an earthquake. Uh, if the earthquake strikes, you see a lot of uh, lightening up. That means people start to communicate about something has happened here. I'm good or I'm not good. Uh, so that tells us that big data is a proxy for human activity. Yeah? And that's the aspect of data that you can uh, uh, exploit to use it for good. Yeah? Imagine if you had this in real time, you could tell the government where this earthquake is happening or even yeah, the, 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 the services that help people where uh, the earthquake hit most yeah? <coughs> and what people are, are doing with it. This is all, of course, anonymized and aggregated. It's about groups. <coughs> it's not about individuals. Yeah? Now, in the sense of this, this is a kind of data uh, that has a lot of external value as well. Yeah? If you look at payment data, you can estimate the economic impact of natural disasters. Search queries like uh, were used in the past to find uh, flu outbreaks, yeah? because suddenly people start to, 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 to search all over the world yeah? about a kind of uh, what to do if you have the flu. And if you capture that, then you can actually uh, draw a map on where flu is b uh, outbreak is happening. Satellite imaging can be used to estimate GDP of countries and mobile phone data, we will see. It can be used for many things uh, for good. So those proxies yeah, help solve large societal problems and even environmental problems. Now, this is an example of those proxy in, 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 in Spain. Yeah? So there are uh, 100 and almost 150,000 antennas of for mobile phones in Spain and they generate 1 billion events every single day. Yeah? It's a huge amount of uh, information, big data. If you anonym anonymize that and aerate that, then you can really create beautiful value from that for society and for, for people and planet. Yeah? Here's another example where you see activity, mobile activity, again in Mexico with flooding, and you can see a very high uh, uh, correlation between when the flooding happens, really, you see that on the on the circles and in mobile phone activity. Again, a, a proxy that helps uh, organizations, humanitarian organizations and government to direct better the support for the people who are in, uh, in, in trouble. Here is an example of w what this kind of data can say in COVID. Yeah? Here we see the first part of COVID. And what you see is a few lines that represent uh, electricity consumption, uh, payment with, uh, with uh, credit cards, uh, and, and uh, mobility, how people move around. And it's very interesting to see uh, that everything that we've seen, so before COVID happened, before the, f the lockdown was there, people started to buy suddenly much more in the supermarkets. When the essential economy was down, you saw a very big uh, valley in energy consumption. And actually, inter-provincial inter mobility of people didn't recover because everybody uh, kept working at home uh, and, and, and didn't travel at all. So you can see how these big uh, distortions of society are reflected in data, and that really can help a lot. <coughs> Here's another example of how big data and artificial intelligence can help against 
uh, fight against the COVID. Yeah? This is an initiative, it's unique in the world, where 16 mobile phone operators share aggregated and anonymized data with the European Commission, such that the European Commission and the European Centre for Disease Control and the European uh, Medical Agency regulator can understand at the European level, level how the virus has propagated through the different countries and depending on what uh, measures the countries take, how that has an impact on, on COVID. Because we all know now that movements of people are very much related with the extension of the vir virus. Yeah? So this is an overlay of mobility data with uh, cases data of COVID. And if you look a bit more in detail on the right hand side, so this is a, a focus on Sardinia and Italy, you see a very high peak in inward uh, travel into Sardinia and two weeks later you see a very big peak uh, in the cases yeah and and, and, and that is really uh, that's what have been learned through this uh, through this data there is really a, a two week separation and it really matters yeah uh, how you uh, how you restrict mobility for for the crisis unfortunately yeah, uh, now at the moment in Europe we are still suffering from this uh, effect um, this is the last example here. You can see that uh, you see a lot of colors within Spain. This is the map of Spain and uh, you probably recognize the, uh, the, the provinces, but really what is here interesting to see is all the different colors that, are, um, that flock together is a kind of mobility community. Yeah? So these are uh, groups of people that uh, move around in a certain area and they move around more in this area than in other areas. Yeah? And that is a kind of proxy for economic activity. Yeah? Now, if governments could confine uh, populations based on these mobility communities, on these economic activity communities, they would still reduce mobility a lot, but on the other hand, they would have much less impact on the economy of the region. Yeah? So it would be an insight generated from uh, big data and artificial intelligence that could help to tackle the crisis but have a less harsh impact on uh, the economy. Yeah? Fortunately, it's not so easy to communicate those kinds of decisions. So as far as we know, no European government has been able to put this into practice, but it is an interesting uh, concept. Now, last example of AI for good is, uh, is about air quality, is about um, the climate change. So about 7 million people die every year uh, because of climate, uh, climate uh, or because of uh, breathing uh, uh, bad quality of air. In Spain it's about 10,000 people. It's three times the people of fatal accidents in, in, in traffic yeah, with cars. Um, so it's really a big problem, especially in big cities. So what we wanted to show here that we can uh, offer a tool that help governments, especially local governments, to better uh, manage and monitor the quality of air in a city. Yeah? And we did that in Madrid. So what we did is we combined a lot of open data that is already published by the local authorities or by the National Statistics Office. We combined it with privately held data about mobility data, what we've seen, yeah? uh, that is used in the fight against COVID of a telecommunications operator, but also with mobile sensors, yeah, air quality sensors that you put on top of a car and then you just drive through the, through the streets and it takes measurement every 10 seconds. Yeah? And the result that you can get with this is a map, as you see there, it's just like a map we are, uh, we are used to see with, uh, with red, orange and uh, green, but now it doesn't mean the intensity of the traffic Red means bad quality of the air, <coughs> green means good air quality. And then if you overlay that with all kinds of things, you can build at the street level yeah, uh, this quality uh, air quality map. You can then also combine it with uh, other public data, like where are schools located? Yeah? And you can know that if there is a school in a certain area and at 11 o'clock when there is the break, there is actually a very peak, high peak of uh, contamination, that would allow governments yeah, of local authorities to intervene and to take decisions. Okay, we have to uh, do something about the traffic at these times of the hour. Yeah? Currently, how is this managed? Well, there are like 21, yeah, uh, in big cities, there are per district, there is one fixed uh, air quality station, and that is an indication for the whole district. Yeah? But what we've seen is that if you drive through different, uh, if, you, if you drive at city level through a, a neighborhood, then that, that one sensor 
can be green, but uh, three blocks away or three streets away even, it's completely uh, a bad quality of the air. So uh, with, this with this technology, you can actually take decisions much more agile and much more frequent. Yeah? And especially if we're now in the area of low zone emissions where it's obligatory for every city with more than 50,000 inhabitants to have a low emission zones, this would be a perfect tool uh, to help that uh, make happen. Uh, because currently it's not done in such a data driven way. Of course, you have to see also what people are affected by uh, by the quality of the air. And you don't want to discriminate like we've seen in, in the other things that certain types of people uh, suffer from uh, worse air quality, age, gender, or even uh, ethnical uh, origin. Yeah? So you want to do it right for everybody. Therefore, also the ethics is, is important in the A for good. All right, so I explained a lot of things to you about uh, uh, good AI for good. Yeah? And I also mentioned uh, something about AI for business. Now, how do you make this happen in an organization? Yeah? How can you take all those things in, in, in practice? Yeah? How can you make them happen? And what do you have to think about? Well, I, I wrote a book about a data-driven company that speaks about three of those four things. It speaks about good AI, yeah? it speaks about business, and it speaks about AI for good. Yeah? So the green AI, I, I'll keep that uh, because that's very recent. I'll keep that for, <laughs> for, for later. But there are uh, clear examples yeah, available of how you go through this journey, because definitely it's not easy to make uh, this happen. It's not only about technology and about machine learning. It's a whole change management process that you have to uh, go through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't ready. Richard, I'm here Hi. taking notes. Hang on, hang on. Let me, let me just get my notes. Oh my god. Here we are. There we are. Richard, my god. <sighs> so much work to do. So of much course. work to do. Well done. Uh, well, the Richard was, is the first, is the last speaker, so uh, keep sending your questions. In the meantime, let me just double check. Okay, uh, talking about AI for good, and uh, you mentioned at the beginning the, um, the bias in the algorithm. So they ask you how to avoid, I mean, is the eternal question, how to avoid undesired bias in algorithms. Uh, this, is this going to be forever a problem or will eventually... Well, I think the good thing is that we are now aware of bias, yeah? Mm. And we also have bias as people, yeah? yeah so yeah. it's not... S on the one thing we say, okay, we need algorithms, AI, to avoid bias, but maybe they have, they have bias, but maybe they have less bias than we have. So <laughs> even they're not perfect, maybe they're better than we. Yeah? Yes, that's that's no the fun. first thing. If you look at bias, where it comes from, it comes it starts with the data yeah? yeah so for instance if you have if you do an uh, if you train an algorithm about schools in a certain neighborhood and you build the algorithm uh, the, the model and you use that model to predict uh, education scores for the whole city then of course you have a problem with bias yeah. because your training data set has not been representative for the target audience that's what happened in the photo i put off of a camera where all the faces have uh, a rectangular except for a black person it, what did so the data that they used for training did not have enough diversity in the data set so if they had taken care of diversity in the data set then of course the algorithm would have learned because an algorithm doesn't know what is a face it doesn't yeah. know what is a nose yeah, yeah so I that's one way to ga get away of bias to s make sure that the data you train is without bias as much as possible. Yeah, but this is like the story of the chicken and the egg. I remember I've, I've been with Chema Alonso from Telefonica, many events, and a lot of people keep asking the same question. Behind the algorithms, there's always a human. So that human, we assume that he has bias, so this is, is an impossible mission. Because, uh, yeah. and then he gives an explanation, which I've forgotten to be honest, but he also explains why not, or how can we avoid that? Well, of course, we have, we have bias. and. If you have a diverse team that builds an algorithm, uh, that helps. But it is to be aware yeah, that th yeah. there is a risk. And if you are aware, you can apply a methodology. Okay. And with this methodology, you can maybe remove not everything, of course. Yeah? This is the data. You have also in the algorithm, you have things that you can do. Yeah? OK, yeah, yeah. So use the methodolog or methodology. OK. Uh, they're also asking you, how ha what happens to the future of work when AI uh, automa auto automa automa 
Oh, this is Automates. Impos an impossible word for Spaniard. <laughs> Automates uh, jobs done by people before. Well, maybe we can have a, a weekend of three days or four days. <laughs> that wouldn't be, wouldn't that be wonderful. <laughs> Just take a few, a couple of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, what happens of the future of work? It's not only the future of the, of the work, it's also the work of the future. Exactly. Yeah? Because well, the yeah. work will completely change. Now, of course, this is a very big topic. And this is one of the topics that you cannot handle as an individual organization. This is really, meant yeah. really government stuff. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's. It's an opinion. Nobody knows what will happen. Yeah. So there yeah. are many different opinions. One is okay. This is yet another technical technological revolution. Many jobs will be destroyed, but new jobs will be created, and then in a few years, no problem. Yeah. In the in the, in the over in the transition period, of course there is a problem because there are people who cannot be upskilled yeah, to what is needed. Uh, but then uh, in the end it will be solved. There are other people who say no. Of, of many of of, of 50 percent or 60 percent of the of the jobs about so you don't automate jobs you automate the tasks within the jobs yeah, yeah. so if you automate 100 percent of the tasks of course you automate the job but usually it's not 100 percent very good answers richard but, eh? but still very good yeah? answers <laughs> there, but there is a, an even uh, uh, it's not only about the future of work it's yeah. about the purpose of life so yeah. lots of us work uh, we get the purpose of our life because we work because we generate income to support our families yeah yeah. Now, if we maintain productivity, would we need less human labor? Yeah. What, what are all those people are going to do? Yeah. Yeah? Good question. My God, so many questions, Mark. So you're going to leave us with a lot of other questions. Uh, regarding, you mentioned the uh, regulation, the European regulation and what is, is, is being done. Uh, uh, but in that sense, uh, Telefonic obviously has uh, many programs. It has the Big Data for Social Good by Luca. Um, what are you? What are your relationship in terms of, of uh, Europe, Europe or international with other programs such as uh, Dig Destination Earth and other kind of programs uh, within European institutions and private companies? Well, in, in terms of so, there's two questions. Yeah, one is yeah. the the European regulation. This is the ethical part, mm -hmm. uh, and the other part is the the AI for good part, yeah? Uh, in both, we work a lot together. We uh, have very close connections with the European Commission. Uh, I personally participate yeah? I, I, in many of the, uh, giving them advice for, for what they can do because there's a lot of talk, but there is little concrete experience. Yeah? And we happen to have uh, some experience because we started uh, already in 2018 uh, with this. So. Also with international organizations, World Economic Forum, the Global Partnership on AI, uh, uh, IEEE, they all work on ethics. So we, of course we work, we share examples. Yeah? I'm also the co-founder of this Observatory for Social and Ethical Impact of AI. And through that we have even more relationships uh, in, in the ethical part. Yeah? Also with the government, uh, with big tech, uh, to learn yeah? what a few companies know, to bring that to all the other companies. Yeah? How, how um, are we getting, uh, are we agreeing? Because how difficult it is to get all these uh, different governments, cultures to agree on something so immaterial in a way. You started talking about uh, Plato and the philosophy and uh, the ethical issues are so yeah, no, subjective. Not it's not easy to no, get. No, it's not easy. And uh, <laughs> actually we should, yeah? Uh, yeah. And therefore there is a focus less on Sometimes there's a focus less on ethics and more on fundamental rights, yeah? the international human rights that is agreed by all the countries uh, in the world. Yeah. So that is a better uh, vehicle to, yeah. to relate this to. But then, I mean, uh, of course, in Asia, the, 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 the notion of community is more important than the individual. Yeah. In, in, in Europe, it's the other way around. The yeah. individual is more important yeah. than the community. Now, so we have a very different uh, notion of privacy than in, yeah. for instance, China, and, and that is what you see. Yeah? So China exactly. was the first company to control COVID because they didn't care about privacy and had the data of everybody, exactly. and they could just confine people, uh, etc. Uh, and then if you look also, if you if you have this example yeah, of of a, of an automatic car that has to choose between killing uh, three burglars or three old people or okay. children exactly in in the western world uh, we promote more children of so course. we want to save children in, yeah. in in the eastern world they want to save seniority they have respect for older people so yeah. those that's things why, are that's what that's what i yeah. mean i mean yeah that makes it very hard it's not just black or white yeah. it's, uh, 
But that's, I think, that is the, the, easy, the, the easier part. Yeah. The difficult part is the geopolitical ones. Yeah. Uh, it's not really about AI. It's about yeah. power and who rules the world. So of you course. have Europe, you have the United States, you have China in AI, yeah. and it's kind of an arms race. In this sense, a uh, final question, it has a lot to do with that. Uh, it seems that this should be a responsibility f by from governments or, uh, yeah, let's say, governments, countries, but on the other hand, private companies, multinational companies like Telefonica has also been a pioneer in many aspects, in, 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 in entrepreneur and in startups, in AI and so many things. Why, why is this? I mean, do you feel like uh, governments are not doing enough, that should the private companies should have a more important role, that you, like Telefonica, can be the driven of this? Uh well, I mean, uh, innovative companies cannot wait for yeah. regulation <laughs> to happen and, uh, and then act. Yeah? The company, I mean, the private sector is always yeah. ahead. ahead. And, and usually governments come with regulation to, hey, hey, don't go too fast or you haven't, haven't thought about this. Yeah? Uh, and that is also happening with, with AI. Yeah? I think there, there are very a huge amount of good opportunities and there are some negative impacts. And of course, the negative impacts, they get so much attention that uh, it triggers a lot of, uh, of al alarms. I think the best thing, uh, Richard, will be to read your book, uh, A Data-Driven Company. Uh, it's uh, 21 lessons for large organizations to create value from AI, which if you don't want to buy it, which you should, maybe you can win it through getting big points on the, uh, on the, on the RNR platform. So rate our talks, participate, etc., etc. Final message, Richard, for closing up this day. What? Uh, give us some homework. Send us a uh, call to action. Give. Uh, just tell the audience what to do. What? What, what do you think? Do. What's the next step? We should uh, maybe as 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 individuals and as a community. I think uh, as individuals, we, we should be more aware yeah, mm -hmm. of uh, and not think, uh, not uh, take the stand okay, uh, this is not for me, uh, it's all happening, and I'm just here as, as a consumer. No, the, the, the audience, uh, the, the people have to be aware of what this technology can do for good and for bad. And yeah. if you want to make companies change, then the best way to do it is through the people. Yeah? But therefore, we need to be more aware. Uh, we need to understand a little bit more. We don't have to be data, data scientists, but we have to be understand a little bit more of this technology to, ha go to, to have a good future. More aware next. Well, we'll take that uh, note of that and we'll read uh, Richard's book and uh, we continue. We have to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Richard, uh, Richard Benjamins from Telefonica.